Over to Rob Sparrow, who is third on the list. Rob. Thanks, John. Also, uh, thank you to Professor Rakesh and to Professor Savalescu for the invitation. Thank you all uh, for being in the audience. Uh, I have an intuition that there's something profoundly anti-egalitarian or elitist uh, about the debate about moral bioenhancement, and that's what I want to uh, explore in this uh, presentation uh, today. Uh, I'm not arguing that I'm, in this presentation, I don't think I'm presenting a sort of all things considered case against moral bioenhancement. So I'm not calling for a ban on moral bioenhancement. I just think that there are some important questions about uh, the aspiration to morally enhance people, but also the kind of world we would create in which some people were biomedically morally enhanced uh, that egalitarians should be uh, concerned about. It's um, the first time I've presented the material, so it could all be wrong, uh, of course. <laughs> now, I think there are actually four different places where there's a tension uh, between egalitarianism and the project of moral uh, bioenhancement. If I slip and talk about moral enhancement, I actually mean moral bioenhancement. I'm, I'm talking about biomedical intervention. It's an interesting question as to whether what I say might apply to moral enhancement uh, more generally. I'm not going to discuss that. So two of the tensions I'm going to discuss occur at the theoretical level and presume that the project of moral bioenhancement is actually plausible. And two of them are practical uh, concerns about the impact of the pursuit of moral bioenhancement on egalitarian social and political relations, uh, which might happen, which are important even if we think that it's a doomed project. So even if we think moral bioenhancement simply isn't going to work, you might still worry about the anti-egalitarian uh, nature of the pursuit of it. Now that's a strange sort of argument to say we shouldn't do this because the project won't work, because presumably if the project won't work, we shouldn't do it for that reason. Uh, but if it turns out that pursuing a doomed project uh, has further bad consequences, that gives you a reason to care about other people doing it. I mean, you know, if you simply think that it's a doomed project and it has no negative consequences, so you want to do that, fine. <coughs> I'm not going to worry about that. But if you think that the pursuit is going to have these sort of anti-egalitarian uh, political implications, you might object to people pursuing it, even if you think it's not going to work. And of course, if there's a slim chance that it, that it won't work, the implications of failure should go into the sort of expected utility calculation. So even if you think that moral bioenhancement is actually pretty unlikely, you might still worry about the anti-egalitarian politics that I'm going to suggest uh, is involved in it or, or uh, that it contributes to. Now, I must admit, I'm personally cynic about the project of moral bioenhancement for reasons that other people have already touched upon. I simply think that there's a big gap between making people more pro-social, which strikes me as being plausible, and making them more, more moral, for reasons that other people have been discussed. But perhaps more, I don't think this point was touched upon briefly in a couple of earlier presentations, if moral bioenhancement is supposed to achieve what Ingmar and Julian demand of it, which is prevent terrorist attacks and prevent climate change, then it has to be compulsory. It has to be applied universally. Uh, because otherwise, the people who are interested, who are suspicious of government and likely to carry out terrorist attacks, they're not going to line up to take a pill to make them uh, more moral. And there's all sorts of free writing problems in relying upon people voluntarily becoming more altruistic to avoid climate change, uh, because if everyone else does it, then you will avoid climate change. Uh, if no one else does it, you don't want to be the only altruist uh, in the room. So it seems to me that a plausible project of moral bioenhancement would have to require putting drugs in the drinking water. And I was kind of pleased to hear Peter's uh, suggestion that adding lithium to the drinking water might be justified, because I think that's what moral bioenhancement would have to look like. It would have to be a universal campaign of drugging us all up to make us better people. And I don't think that's ever going to come to pass in any democratic society. You know, it, it's a struggle to put drugs in the water, chemicals in the water that would prevent tooth decay. The chances of, of people in a democratic society being comfortable with the government drugging them up to make them better people is so slim that I essentially think the project of moral bioenhancement is a science fiction uh, scenario. 
Uh, so having said that, though, uh, for the first half of the remainder of this presentation, I'm going to assume that people will set out to universally prescribe <coughs> drugs to the population that will, in fact, um, succeed in making some of the population more moral. Uh, now, notice that universal, the attempt at universal uh, moral uh, bio-enhancement doesn't get you everyone ends up being morally enhanced. Uh, there will be natural genetic variation in the population or different responses to the drugs or different histories that mean after we've done our moral bio-enhancement, there will be some people who are more moral than others. Uh, that in fact this project would predictably exacerbate the amount of inequality between the morally enhanced and those people who for some reason haven't responded to the treatment and remain uh, morally vicious. A working technology presumes also the science that would allow us to tell who was morally enhanced or not. So now we've moved to a society in which we can say, this half of the room, you're all nicer, better people, you lot over there, you remain vicious normals. And now we can see why you might think there was an issue here for political relations in a future biomedically enhanced uh, society. I think that there would be a case to be made, and I expect some people in this audience uh, would make it, for arguing for differential political representation of the morally bio-enhanced and mere normals. The morally better people should rule. So it's essentially a platonic argument about the guardians, buttressed with some doggy pseudoscience, or in this case that I'm imagining, reliably being able to identify the best amongst us so we can put them into the class of the guardians. Now I think there's some, there are some pretty good reasons to think that there's a limit to this argument. I don't think moral enhancement would produce post-persons. Uh, I still think that you would end up, so there's not a danger that the morally better will suck all the resources away from the, the mere normals. Merely by virtue of being better behaved, they're not going to end up with strong rights to eat you first in the way that Nick was worried about uh, yesterday. So I think a society in which some people were objectively, scientifically, morally better than others would still have to respect a certain basic equality of interests. But I, I think it's compatible with that, that you might get uh, privileged access to positions of social and political authority by virtue of being uh, morally uh, enhanced. That when we're looking for someone to sit on the bioethics committee, we don't want to let a mere normal person, we want to let someone who's reliably moral, promoting a concern, altruistic and concerned with justice. So there's two reasons, I think, here for um, for thinking that the, um, the project of moral bioenhancement would um, uh, would generate this sort of, sort of anti-egalitarian implication. One is actually in Buchanan's work on the impact of cognitive enhancement and this idea that the cognitively enhanced might be what he calls enhanced cooperators. The benefits of various forms of social cooperation and collaboration are dependent upon the uh, capacities of the participants. So adults, Buchanan talks about adults being able to play games that children can't and realise certain interests. So, in he, he's concerned about cognitively enhanced post-persons um, thinking we really want to engage in this complex social participation which if we let the merely normal people in we won't be able to realise the goals that we're seeking. So in order to achieve our legitimate interests in uh, human flourishing and achieving our individual goals we need to exclude <coughs> people from social practices that actually produce significant benefits. And of course, if you're systematically excluding one class of people from participation in something that generates serious political benefits, uh, serious economic or social economic or political benefits, uh, what you're doing is establishing a, a caste system. You're establishing differential uh, political rights depending upon whether you're enhanced 
or onion heads. Now that he, um, Buchanan doesn't um, discuss this case, but I actually think that argument works pretty well for morally enhanced. Think about all the ways in which social co cooperation is bedeviled by problems of trust. You know, are other people going to free ride on me? What should I commit to this process if other people might defect? Now, if I can know that I'm only cooperating with the, you know, Microsoft 2.3 moral enhanced category of people, then I can um, gain benefits from that cooperation that are threatened if I let the merely normal in. So the morally, bio, you know, the morally enhanced have a legitimate interest, I think, in forms of social cooperation with other people who are also morally enhanced and in excluding the merely normal. So you could, I think, uh, go from being able to reliably identify a group of people as morally better to the conclusion that they should have certain social and economic privileges that you would deny to those people uh, for <coughs> whom moral enhancement has failed. Now, of course, if you buy that argument, you might think, what's the problem? That's justified. They genuinely do have uh, an increased right to these resources, uh, or increased right to political participation. So yes, it's inegalitarian, but that's just the way it goes. And that's, that's an option here. There's also another more direct argument to, say, to differential access to position of so <coughs> positions of social and political responsibility to the enhanced and the unenhanced, which simply does buy the platonic argument and, and depends upon your fundamental account of the justification of democracy. Uh, that is, of course, tremendously why we think that uh, democratic societies are better. It's a tremendously uh, complex and controversial question. But again, I think there's actually um, a, number, on a number of the most plausible accounts of the justification of democracy being able to identify a class of people who are morally enhanced is actually corrosive. Uh, so, I mean, so if you think the goal, if you, your justification for uh, democratic government is simply a consequentialist one, you know, over the course of human history, democratic governments reliably produce better outcomes, then it's certainly open to, open to you to claim that uh, governments which privilege the morally bio-enhanced will also produce better outcomes because those people are reliably inclined to consider the public interest in a way in which the merely normal uh, do not. If you combine this with an elitist theory of government, so, uh, sorry, an elite theory of democracy, which essentially says the only plausible form of democratic government in a mass society is competition between two, meritocracy, uh, two technocratic governments or government by experts, and you have regular elections to toss them out should they do something terribly wrong, uh, then again, I think you should try to be drafting, making sure that the political elites consist in the uh, morally enhanced. If your account of democratic theory or, or the justification of um, democracy is a epistemic conception, so democratic government is the form of government that most reliably identifies the, either the end, proper ends or means uh, of government, because if we increase the number of participants, we increase the chance that the, uh, a democratic majority decision will be correct, then again, you might think that restricting debate about the choice about the ends of a democratic society would be improved by privileging the, the morally enhanced. Even, and I'm not sure whether this is true or not, but I suspect that on some versions of deliberative democracy, which is where the process of democratic government is supposed to consist in reason giving. You know, the mutual deliberation about the reasons that apply, you might want to make sure that all the public speakers were morally enhanced, because they're less likely to, uh, to lead public deliberation astray. There's lots of work to be done there, but I actually think there's a plausible case to be made that were we able, that were we to undertake universal 
moral bioenhancement, and we could identify the enhanced, that we should in fact uh, privilege them in our processes of government. And that, I think, uh, should be uh, a bad thing if you're egalitarian. There's another, there's another intuition about the whole moral enhancement debate, which is essentially says, who are you to tell me what is moral? That seems to me a very basic intuition about the whole moral bioenhancement debate. Um, how do we know what's moral? The first sight, that's actually a weaker objection because the advocates of moral bioenhancement have been very modest in their claims. They just pick things like eliminating racism or aggression or boosting altruism and a sense of justice. And who could object to that? But if you think about the debate within liberal political theory about the nature of political neutrality, it becomes very quickly obvious that advocates of moral bioenhancement are committed to a version of moral perfectionism. I mean, actually, Jay was quite upfront uh, about this yesterday. Moral bioenhancement is not neutral between conceptions of the good. If you really make me more altruistic, I can't flourish on Wall Street. So certain modes of living become less viable in a society where the government is drugging up its citizens. So again, there's a point there. Some people think that the problem with moral perfectionism is that it's anti-egalitarian, that, that it's privileging some ideas about the nature of the good. What if moral bioenhancement uh, doesn't work? Well, there's two options here. There's one that it doesn't work and we don't know that. And I actually think that's pretty likely. Scientists, like all of us, are terribly vulnerable to wishful thinking. Think about all those people who saw canals on Mars. Think about the history of surgeries, that when you 40 years of surgery, you do a meta-analysis and you discover it doesn't have any effects. Scientists are also prone to, to sort of find what they want to find. So if you embark on this project of moral bioenhancement, I'm pretty sure that those people who do it will end up thinking that they are the moral elite. So moral bioenhancement will actually encourage people who already think that they know better than others uh, to um, work in anti-democratic ways, in, in non-egalitarian ways. So even were the project to fail, there's a real risk that political elites would say, trust us, you know, not only am I a doctor, but I'm morally better than you because I happen to have had this enhancement, which obviously didn't work uh, for you. So even were the project to fail, there's a chance that uh, those in political power would use this technology to license their rule in a way. And in that case, that would be completely unjustified, at least in the case where they genuinely are morally better. Uh, they would have some sort of case. But if the technology fails and they really think they're morally better, that would be disastrous. Now finally, there's the chance that um, moral bioenhancement just fails dismally, and we all admit that. I suspect that we should, that's the most probable outcome now, but maybe we do 10 years of dragging up the population, and then we look at our social statistics and discover that people aren't really uh, there's still terrorist attacks, global warming <coughs> continues uninterrupted, and there might be less rape and murder, but it turns out that people are still pretty nasty to each other and will give up on the whole project. Why would that be bad? One reason that would really be bad is the opportunity costs of us, of philosophers, talking about these questions. When we're thinking about global warming, there's some technologies that might work, which I suspect is economic and political reform, and there's some technologies that are highly unlikely to work, geoengineering simply because of the time scale, and I suspect moral enhancement. The time to do something about climate change is now. We can't afford to do 30 years of research on speculative drugs and discover that they don't work. Finally, um, and, and to my mind, this is the, the sort of worst thing about the debate about moral bioenhancement, is the extent to which it encourages the idea that there is already a natural genetic moral aristocracy. That it's licensing the return of sociobiology into mainstream political and philosophical debate. Because in order to make the case for moral bioenhancement, you have to make all these arguments about how some people have naturally <coughs> genetically inclined to violence or naturally genetically declined, uh, inclined to virtue. 
And that seems to me the real problem here, in that in having these discussions, what the public hears is that there are people out there who are naturally evil, and it's no surprise that they will be you know, the poor, the dark-skinned, those people who are overrepresented in prisons already. And there are some people who are naturally virtuous, and that'll turn out to be us. Uh, and that, to my mind, is the real reason why we should be much more cynical about the project of moral bioenhancement. Because <laughs> even if it fails, and I think it's likely to fail, the costs of having this discussion are much higher than people are, are recognising. Thank you, Rob. Admirably, admirably to time and a wonderful argument against the historical pretensions of a priesthood. A better one I've never heard. And there are hundreds of people um, <laughs> wanting to get in on the act here. And Julian put his hand up 10 minutes before the end of the talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll start, I'll start with... That's with, cheating, with, Julian. And, and can again, we just have the same system. We'll take the questions first. There, there are so many problems. It's difficult to know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just give you one, uh, one problem with this idea of this. Reasonably triggered in his <coughs> So I was a centre, okay? and predictably, people being what they are, there are contributors and there are free riders. Okay? And I try to pick the contributors when I'm uh, you know, hiring staff and eliminate the free riders. Now, in a sense, I'm privileging the, the contributors. But why am I doing that? I'm doing it because they do a better job in the centre. So the fact that you might privilege the morally in some political system would be because they'll do a better job. And that's not, a, that's not an unreasonable privileging, that's just you know, rewarding merit. So I can't see how this kind of a factor could be truly represents as best Thank you. The meritocracy is alive and well. Uh, just uh, for the sake of uh, balance, which I'm not really normally in favour of, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll come next to him, Mark. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's assume that sort of, we have some <coughs> effective means of bioenhancement. Now, you were saying that in order to, to uh, apply these methods, we, we need to sort of um, know what's morally right and so on. But you seem to be knowing it yourself because you were appealing to some uh, uh, moral ideas, egalitarianism, moral interest, and democratic ideas. Now, I suppose that is. <coughs> morally correct, <coughs> and we have this effective methods. In that case, it, it would seem we would produce pe more people who are egalitarians and who respect equality of interest. Furthermore, if there is this sort of tendency towards class, uh, class, class society, I mean, there would be an additional reason for other people to, people who aren't egalitarian, to, to respect it, because they would have a credential uh, in order to avoid being excluded. So we would, in that way, uh, sort of create a more egalitarian society, if you say. Thank you. Quite enough balance. Uh, <laughs> yes, Nick. Uh, yeah, I, I was interested in your uh, concern about morally fine uh, politicians. And I'm thinking of uh, the depressing propensity of democracies to elect total scumbags <laughs> who are. Uh, exceptionally good at sort of presenting themselves as morally upright. So I guess I sort of, it wouldn't be so bad, but I guess in some jurisdictions in which politician candidates for political office release their medical records, would it be so bad to you know, make sure they're not going to die of cancer, sort of, you know, halfway through their term, would it be so bad if someone sort of said, look, I've, I've been on this moral fire and that's uh, uh, 10 years, you have some reason to believe me when I say that I'm not a total scumbag. Fine. Uh, can the people who wanted to talk just give me another show? Right, yeah. For the sake of having people who haven't spoken very much. What? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Okay. Uh, I, I was wondering, what, is, what are you thinking about uh, reintroducing the million idea of plural walking in this context? Because uh, basically his idea was that uh, educated people, the votes of educated people should count more than uneducated, but then we know that there is uneducated majority of the people, so by, uh, by majority rule, 
there is some guarantee that their interests will be protected. So there, uh, he was thinking that uh, uh, by relaxed rule, rule, we can have balance of uh, majority of uh, uneducated who can block these educated elites, or in this context, morally enhanced elites, and then still have uh, significant influence uh, of those morally enhanced people that could, uh, uh, of course, uh, influence uh, final decisions in the sense that they would be morally bad. Thank you. And uh, Jay, I think, mm -hmm. and then one more. Yeah, I'm going to struggle for another <laughs> <of> the past <laughs> <laughs> so to identify that technology might create some future social problem when in fact that social problem already exists and we already have means to address it. And it doesn't, and the, the technological issue really doesn't address it. So in the case of this particular problem, at least a long way playing through and we, the way we address it is the application of elites and, and greater accountability for the political powers. Uh, physicians make claims of greater moral superiority. They take the Hippocratic oath, and therefore we have to give them greater power in society. We democratize our relationship with physicians. Prisoners already lose the franchise, and the way that we solve this particular problem is to fight to keep prisoners to have the franchise, the next concept of franchise. So that's one problem. The second is, um, do you think that it's defensible to say that we should, in, in general, privilege people, give people more power in society, who are illiterate? And we could have said a few years ago that there are all these inegalitarian consequences that could, uh, that could come from this literacy thing. People who are more literate are going to make more money, their kids are going to be more literate, we'll just have a deprecation of society into the literate and the unliterate, two different races all together. No, we said you, literacy is a good in itself. And everybody should have access to literacy. And if there is, in fact, that differential uh, power on the basis of literacy, it's probably good. Thank you. Last question from Johnny. I'm sorry I missed your name before. Um, so my, my kind of question in touched on a few of the points already made, but maybe a slightly different angle. So we were worried about protectionism. And so a few of people suggested that um, this might be applicable to lots of other things that governments do. So the example of putting fluoride into the water seems to be an example of someone who's not help. What well, I think might be interesting to consider is that we believe that the framing effect is as powerful as many people claim it ever is. And it seems that whenever we offer someone a choice in a democratic situation, we can only be uh, maybe subconsciously prioritizing one option over the other. And so that leaves us in a bit of a tricky situation. Being when we're offering a choice, then we're engaging some sort of uh, perfectionism. And that seems to be what we have as well. Thank you. You have. Three and a half minutes <laughs> to answer all of those yeah. points. By my measure, I don't even have that. I've got it too. Uh, look, in many ways, I think perhaps the first three responses from Julian, Ingmar, and Nick just illustrate my claim at the beginning that some people will simply think this follows that, uh, that yes, of course, we should privilege uh, the, the morally uh, bioenhanced. Now, of course, to me, that's a confirmation of my thesis. Uh, and there's a general problem here, which is that one person's reductio is another person's brave you know, intellectual conclusion. And so it seems to me, yes, this is going to split audiences. Some people will say, yeah, that simply does follow. Let's put the morally better in charge. Uh, I think that's problematic, but I didn't think that I had here fully justified uh, that intuition. I do think that there are two distinctions there are two things that matter here. One is the distinction between being better at uh, identifying the means of achieving some set of political goals and the other of being better able to identify uh, the ends of, of a democratic politics. And, and presumably moral enhancement as opposed to cognitive enhancement makes people better at identifying the ends of politics. Now, of course, political elites have always um, claimed that but I think it is a kind of more threatening inequality if you can identify some people and say, these are the people who should be determining uh, the ends of politics. I also think that moral bioenhancement, were it to work, and of course there's always this dynamic where people say, I'm defending something radically new. You know, this is going to change everything. We're all going to have two heads and machines and stuff. It's going to be great. And then you push them and they retreat to that. Yeah, surely reading is a good idea. You look at our most powerful enhancement was agriculture or, or mathematics. Uh, and so the, the illiterate analogy, I think it's, it's less clear that, that reading facilitates the pursuit of ends. Uh, better, better is a moral enhancement. I think it's a cognitive enhancement. It's less clear that it's a 
moral enhancement. You've got to remember how sophisticated uh, non-literate cultures were. It's not that these people weren't capable of identifying uh, the proper ends of life. Ten seconds, Ralph. Okay. Yeah. Plural voting, yes. I suspect that now, given this presentation, one of you will go away and write a paper uh, saying that in the future the morally enhanced should have more votes. I wasn't going to suggest that, but I think it, it does. Uh, it does follow if you do you think that we can reliably identify the enhanced. Uh, what was the last? It wasn't, it wasn't ten seconds for each point. It was just no, no, ten no. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Look, there's a uh, social smallness to Jonathan's point. There are well-known problems with liberal neutrality. I mean, some people think that any politics is essentially perfectionist. And if that's true, then it's no surprise that moral enhancement will also turn out to involve perfectionism. But there's at least some, the intuition, who are you bastards to tell me what's moral, has got more force than it first appears. Because in pursuing moral bioenhancement, we're not leaving competition between ways of life untouched. We're privileging some rather than others, and you might object to that. Let's talk more later. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Rob. Now...